In this episode, I'm going to add basic types to this new base layer. Basic types are important because you end up using them in code all over the place and having nice succinct names that are regular, easy to change in, from one size to the, to the next or uh, switching from signed to unsigned, those kinds of things, being able to do that without lots of irregularities in the size of the names and the uh, meanings of the names on different situations or, you know, things like this, it really makes a lot of just day-to-day -day tasks easier. It also makes code generation easier if we ever want to go down that road. Uh, so that's kind of the best reason for doing it. And since you're going to use them so much, it's going to really pay off in the long run to, to get a little bit of friction out of the way. While doing this, it's also nice to just have some other stuff that goes along with these basic types, min, max values, other useful constants, uh, wrappers for math things that will originally be just grabbing from the C, rander, the C standard runtime, but that we'll want to switch off of the C standard runtime potentially some days. So we'll, we'll want wrappers for those math things. And, you know, the sort of extended basic types, things like vectors, intervals, uh, that stuff. So that's what we're going to get to. Let's let's get into it. Okay, so that's pretty much it for what the basic types actually are. My naming scheme that I've chosen here is signed will use S, unsigned will use U. They're all uppercase. My floating points will use F. I also set aside B for Boolean types, uh, and I just put a bit count on each one of them. Uh, that's that's pretty much it. It's pretty pretty self-explanatory. You also notice I just threw in this thing called void func. <clears throat> it's a little bit of a weird rule, but technically in C and C++ you're not supposed to use data pointers and procedure pointers or function pointers interchangeably. They're not necessarily the same size, although they are in practice on everything you use. Just for picky compilers that will point this out, I like to have a void func type so that I can say whenever my, uh, whenever I have a parameter in or parameter out or something where it's a member or a table of things that are function, param function pointers instead of data pointers, rather than typing void star, I'll type void func star. That way I'm technically using something of the right size for a function pointer, uh, it does it does have the downside that unlike void star, it doesn't cast automatically. But there is nothing in the languages that both follows the rules and casts automatically for function pointers. So it's a little bit like what can you do? Okay, so that's the basic types. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and add in a bunch of helpful constants next. Okay, so before I continue with these float constants, I just want to make a const, uh, a statement about uh, some of the stuff I've done so far. So those first few things I did uh, are just some basic numerical constants that are helpful. If you want to get the largest or smallest possible floating point values, um, you there's no way in the C or C++ language to, to specify a constant it looks like that unless you use really new features that I don't want to use that do uh, hexadecimal stuff. Although I don't know if even those actually work the way you would want. I don't know if those let you specify in hex the bit pattern or if they're just hexadecimal representations of the floating point value still that still don't give you a way to put in the pattern for infinity. But what you can do is you can use a little uh, online floating point converter tool. Let me show you what I mean. So if you go to this floating point converter and you want to see how do we get infinity, 
uh, the answer is this tool will give you the correct bit pattern for infinity and it'll even give it to you back as a hexadecimal. So what I've done there is I've just unioned together those 32-bit fields and then in the hexadecimal input or I send the hexadecimal input into the unsigned integer and then I return the float and that gives me positive infinity. I can also get negative infinity in a similar way. So it's a little annoying to have to do our infinity constants that way, but writing it as a function is the easiest way to not have to do it by initializing something or some weird hacky expressions that aren't uh, easy to read. I think that this is just a nice way to get it done. Okay, so there's our basic constants. Uh, the next thing we want to do is some math functions. So since we're already doing float topic stuff, let's keep floats on the mind and do... Uh, a few things we can do with um, floats by just what we know from their bit patterns. Okay, so the idea here is that an absolute value function for a float is actually a pretty easy thing to write yourself you're just masking off the uh, top bit. And so I use the same union trick I used for the infinities and I mask off the highest bit for whatever the appropriate size is. And what you get back is the same float just without the, the negative sign bit uh, there if it was. So that's that's our the rest of our floating point uh, bit manipulation tricks for now. So for the rest of these, I'm just gonna call um, the, the math header and get us up and running. Okay, I think we're ready to move on. So the last big thing is we want to put in some basic uh, compound types, vectors and intervals in particular, the ones that I'm going to want. And once we've done those, we're also going to do a lot of helper functions for them. So this is going to be a little bit of an involved step. There's a lot of repetitive parts here. And it can be tempting to just switch this over to a code gen solution, but I've tended to towards liking just doing it by hand, even though it's a little bit tedious. Uh, once you do something with code gen, you either have to keep maintaining that code gen forever, which gets a little complicated and makes this more work than it's worth, or you end up having to maintain it by hand later anyway, and then it's not quite laid out right, and so you might as well just, you know, if you're going to do something annoying, make the annoying thing be tedious, not compli complicated, you know what I mean? So let's do these, uh, let's do these compound types. Okay, so we have here all of the compound types that I like, or at least that I want for starting off with. There's probably a few others that will come up over time if you know specific needs come up, but these will cover us uh, for pretty much all the basics that are worth covering for now. So um, in particular, uh, I'd like to explain a little bit about my choice of naming scheme now. So I'm using capital letters for all of my types, and the reason I'm doing that is because it's fairly common in mathematical notation for sets to be capital letters and for elements of sets to be uh, lowercase letters. And I like to think of 
type systems as essentially being ways of encoding sets of possible values and variables and functions as being specific elements uh, drawn from those sets that describe the rest of the program, right? So, you know, I, I, there's a little bit of wiggle room. For instance, I use the capital letter for the macros too sometimes, uh, but for the most part, the idea is capital letter type, lowercase letter is a value and functions count as values. Uh, I'm also going with a super regular and dense naming scheme for these. So instead of vector 2D S32 or something or vector 2D integer, I'm going V2 means vector two dimensions and S32 means it's based on S32s, my basic type, right? Uh, V3 F32 would then be a three dimensional uh, floating point vector in 32 bit coordinates, right? So that's that's the naming scheme there. And for intervals, I'm going I, and then there's still a dimension number that comes after that. So I1 are one dimensional intervals, a min and a max, the normal thing you think of as an interval. If it's got a two on it, that's kind of like saying rectangle, right? So I2 is sort of the Cartesian product of two intervals. Uh, in other words, it's an axis aligned rectangle uh, where you have a, a min point and a max point in two dimensions. So that's the naming scheme we're going with. Um, also just explain, I, I like to choose U64 instead of S32 or anything else to go with uh, my integer interval range because when I'm doing work with intervals, it's gonna often be useful to be able to specify things like intervals in memory ranges, intervals of sizes, things like that when I'm doing integer stuff. So for intervals, U64 is the useful integer type. For integer, for uh, vectors, uh, S32 is a useful type, and we probably also want a two-dimensional S32 now that I think about it, and we might not actually need three-dimensional and four-dimensional points in S32. So I'm going I'm to tweak that real quick, because the real reason to use uh, S32s for a V2, for a two-dimensional vector, is for things like pixel coordinates, uh, other discrete coordinates, which we'll tend to do in, in two dimensions. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ax the three- and four-dimensional integer vectors and then I'm going to add in a rectangle or an I2 for the S32 type and then uh, then then I'll go right into writing some constructors for these things. Okay, so I've just finished sort of planning out all of the functions that I think I'm going to implement to get us started. And I just wanted to make a couple notes. First of all, this is a lot of speculative writing of code, things that I expect that I'll want instead of things that I know I'm going to do next, which I usually am very, very strongly against. I was almost never going to do this kind of thing. But this is pretty much the one exception because... Well, the point is I've done code bases a number of times now, and I've just gotten used to the kinds of stuff that I want over and over again. And I've come to the opinion that when I'm getting started, if I just get some of these basics that I generally always want in there right away, then I avoid sort of accruing slight bits of cruft where uh, for a few days I was rolling a certain thing by hand every time. So I wrote out a bunch of little logic, like you know checking if something's in ranges and stuff over and over again the same way. And eventually I will uh, be, you know, adding those things in that actually wrap that up in a nice little operator overload or, you know, constructor function or helper function. But there'll be a few spots here and there where I didn't use it. And so they're floating around and the functions will kind of grow into or disorganization. They'll have a bit of chaos to how they get added and when they get added and where they get added, which, I don't know, I, I think it, it takes away from my sense of uh, clarity about what's going on when I'm looking around the code base trying to 
take stock of things later on. So having just a nice group of these things right up front with solid signal of how they're going to be organized just means that when later on new stuff does need to get added, because inevitably I'm not going to think of everything right away, it will still be pretty easy to see how to organize things. And I won't have to make organizational decisions in the middle of other tasks because I've made an organizational decision right here and now by writing all that stuff. It might be a bit of a tedious way to get a code base up and running, and it, it involves this sort of speculative writing of code, which I'm not a huge fan of. But this is pretty good place to do it if it's going to ever happen. Um, so let's go ahead and implement these. Hopefully that won't take too long because a lot of this is going to be pretty copy and paste and, you know, keyboard macro -y to get it all built out. But uh, this is definitely one of those things where I'm not going to test it super thoroughly and we're going to probably find some issues with it as we're using it, but that's totally fine. This stuff gets used so heavily that it's, it's going to surface as soon as there's a bug. You know, these kinds of things, bugs don't slip until too late. They, they show up as soon as you hit them. So let's get these functions in there, and then uh, that's, that'll be it for today.